Welcome. We're up to session number 17 of the Apostolic Training School and this morning's subject is the Day of the Lord. Say the Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. Hallelujah. So this is, this is a follow-up subject on when Apostle Paul was sharing on preparing for his coming. And so we're, we're looking at it in another aspect because in the scriptures uh, a phrase comes up quite a lot, the Day of the Lord. And, and so we want to learn about that day, how we can prepare for that day and what is that day talking about. And, and so we want to, I just want to start by saying the word day, the word day in the Hebrew is number, number 3117. Hebrew number 3117, and it's the word yom. Say yom. yom. It's not, yeah, not when you've had a good meal and you say yom. <laughs> it's Y-O-W-M, Y-O-W-M, is the way they do it in Strong's Concordance. Yom. So that's where we get it, you know, Yom Kippur. Who's heard of that? That means the Day of Atonement. Okay. And so yom is the word for day. And this is, it comes from a root word, so just put from root, meaning to be hot. So the day is pretty hot. And it's called that. It, the reason why it comes from that root really is because the day refers to the time of day where it's hot, the sun is up. And, and it says it can be literal or figurative. So it can be meaning literally a particular day of the week or figuratively a period of time. A space of defined time. And I just want to bring out the first mention of this word is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 5. And I just want you to see this here. So the first mention of the word day in the scriptures is in Genesis 1, verse 5. And it says that God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the day's got to do with light. Because God called the light day. And at this particular time, there was no sun, moon or stars. He only created them on the fourth day. So, <laughs> so the day isn't really talking about the 24-hour Sunday. It is in the scriptures very often in the context, but in this, the first mention has actually got to do with the light. And see, God said, let there be light, and light was. See, this was the light that was proceeding from God. Amen? This was God's light. This was revelatory light. This was light coming from God, and he called that light day, and he called the darkness night. So in the day, there's no darkness. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, this is still under this point, so you can just do it here. So in, in 1 John chapter 1 verse 5, it says, God is light and in him there is no darkness. Hallelujah. So God is light. God is the day. And so there is no room for darkness in the day. So even as we're coming to look at the day of the Lord, it's a day of light. It's a day where there's no darkness. Hallelujah. Are you getting it? It's a day where God is manifested as light. He is light. And he fully manifests himself and there's no more darkness. Hallelujah. So are you looking for the day of the Lord? And it says, I just want you to see in Revelation chapter 21... Still under this point. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23 talks about the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And it says, The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. So this city lives in the day of the Lord. Amen. This city is functioning in the day where there's no need for the sun or the moon because the Lamb is the light. Wow. Hallelujah. God called the light day. The Lamb is the light. So when the Lamb is manifested, we're in the day. Hallelujah. The day of the Lord. And so we as the city of God are meant to be living in the day. 
So I want to just I just want to put this out there to you that the day of the Lord is something that you that we are to be walking in now so that when the day of the Lord really comes, we're already there. We're walking in the day. Amen. We're not in darkness. We see clearly. Hallelujah. We're not walking by the natural light anymore. We're walking by the day of the Lord. And I want you to see just one more of scripture under this point. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18 says, we could put 18 and 19. It says this, But the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. This is the walk we are on, brethren. If you put up your hand if you're righteous, if you're just, how do you get righteous? Because of believing in Jesus, because of faith. The just shall live by faith. And it says, so the path of the righteous, the path of the just is like the shining sun that keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. Hallelujah. You see, we are walking unto the day of the Lord and things are getting brighter and brighter and brighter until that perfect day. Hallelujah. Who's excited to be on this journey? So you, you as a righteous person walking with Jesus, you're walking a path that shines ever brighter to the perfect day. And it says in verse 19 that the way of the wicked is like darkness. See, the day of the Lord has got to do with the righteous shining in that light of the day, but for the wicked it's a day of darkness. Because the wicked are like darkness. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Hallelujah. So I want to look now, we can just put a heading after this, called yeah, some Old Testament prophetic scriptures of the day of Yahweh. Old Testament prophetic scriptures of the day of Yahweh. And let's start in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. And verse 12, the whole passage really goes from verse 12 to 22. This is what Isaiah had to say in his day. He said, For the day of Yahweh of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. So what's this speaking of? The day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, is a day of judgment upon everything proud and lofty upon everything lifted up. So it's a pretty serious day, isn't it? It's a day of bringing everything proud low. Who gets excited that that's a good day? Amen? That everything that is lifted up gets brought down. Everything that is exalting itself against the knowledge of God is finally dealt with. Hallelujah. The day of Yahweh shall come upon everything proud and lofty. In verse 13 it says, It will come upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan. In some of the other prophetic scriptures, like in Ezekiel, trees of those sorts of nations are representing kings and commanders and leaders. So we could say that this, in verse 13, the day of Yahweh comes upon the kings and the commanders, the rulers of nations. So it comes upon the kings and commanders. Hallelujah. Who's looking forward to the day of Yahweh when all kings and commanders that do not exalt the name of Jesus will be brought low? Hallelujah. This is the day of the Lord. This is what we can expect. It says in verse 14 that this day will come upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up. It comes upon the mountains and the hills. In the scriptures, in prophetic scriptures as well, the mountains can really be representing kingdoms. Nations, the hills are a bit lesser than that. Cities and, and also principalities and powers. High places. So the day of Yahweh is coming upon all the high places, all the principalities and powers. It's coming upon nations and cities. And it says in verse 15, it will come upon every high tower and upon every fortified wall. So it's going to come upon military power and might. 
Hallelujah. It's going to destroy military power and might. Yes, amen. The day of Yahweh is very awesome. In verse 16 it says, The day of Yahweh will come upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all the beautiful sloops. These were, these were ships of commerce. It will come upon all the economic systems. The day of Yahweh will come upon all the commerce and, and, and economic and financial systems of the world. And then it says in verse 17, The loftiness of man, the pride of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. Hallelujah. And so let's just put here, yes, that the day of Yahweh is a day where Yahweh is exalted, where he is seen for who he really is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in verse 18 it says, But the idols he shall utterly abolish. So every idol is abolished in the day of Yahweh. Every idol will be seen to be, for what, seen to be what it is. Nothing. A statue. A, a, a dead thing. And then it says in verse 19, That they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth, from the terror of Yahweh and the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Wow. There's going to be a shaking. There's a shaking of the earth. The day of Yahweh is a day of terror, but it's also a day of the glory of his majesty. And so the glory of his majesty is a terror to those who are wicked and are idol worshippers and are involved just in the world system and, and caught up in that. It's a day of terror. But it's a day of the glory of his majesty for those who are looking for him. Amen. It's a day when the earth will shake. So that's also, that verse, just keep your hand there, but under, under verse 19 there's another um, point. That, look in Revelation chapter 6. And you'll see that in verse 15 to 17, the Apostle John really picks it up. Here as well. It says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the suckling lambkin. That's what the word lamb there means. It doesn't mean even a one-year-old lamb. It means a baby lamb. It means a suckling lamb. That's what the word lamb there is there. It means a lambkin, a little lamb. So, a pickaninny sheep sheep. (laughs) And so, in that day of the Lord, they're going to be saying, hide, hide ourselves. Let's hide ourselves from the face of him who sits on the throne and of that little lamb. The wrath of that little lamb. (laughs) <laughs> isn't God awesome hallelujah just revealing the very nature of the lamb so pure, undefiled, unblemished innocent, holy still even gentle but terrible on that day for it says for the verse 17 of, the, of Revelation 6 for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand So the day of Yahweh is actually a great day of his wrath. And who is able to stand? Hallelujah. Let's just go back and finish off in Isaiah chapter 2. Because it says again in, in verse 20 and 21, that in that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each for himself to worship to the moles and bats, Verse 21, to go into the clefts of the rocks. See, they're throwing away their idols, but they're not turning to God. They just realise their idols have got nothing. And, but they're still trying to hide. They realise, well, the idol's not going to help us. How did we just got to find a hiding place? Because the day has come and it's terrible. Brethren, we as the church, we're to live in view of this day. This day is real. Amen. This day is not just you know, a good story in the Bible. See, how many, how many of us are really living in view of this day? You know, it says about Noah 
in Hebrews chapter 11 that by faith he was warned of things not yet seen and he was moved with godly fear then. He was moved with godly fear. Say, moved with godly fear. So because he knew that the day was coming, he was moved with godly fear to be preparing the ark. Amen? He was moved to be doing something. He wasn't moved to be waiting around for a rapture. He wasn't moved to be waiting to go to heaven. He was moved to do something. He was moved to build the ark that would save his household. Hallelujah. And so the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, is to move us into action. And then it says in verse 22 of Isaiah 2, this is, this is, this is one way that we can prepare for the day. Sever yourselves from such a man. What's such a man? Such a man who worships idols and who doesn't worship God. Such a man who, who, who's just in the world system and doesn't worship the living and true God. Sever yourselves from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? In other words, don't put your trust in men, don't put your trust in the world system, don't put your trust in people that don't trust the Lord. Sever yourselves from such a person. In other words, come out from among them, brethren, and be separate. Hallelujah. So in view of the day of Yahweh, let's be holy. Let's be separated unto the Lord. Sever ourselves from putting our trust in people, putting our trust in the economy of the world. Amen. Don't put your trust in your super. Amen. So many people in 2008 lost their super. We're in another cycle now, seven years later. So just be careful. Something could happen this year again. So don't put your trust in the world in any way. Sever yourselves. Hallelujah. Let's look at another prophetic scripture of the day in Ezekiel chapter 13. The day is a day of light. Amen, remember? It's a day where God, who is light, is revealed. And everything haughty and proud will be brought low. What did John the Baptist come saying? Well, it said he was a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight, prepare the way of the Lord. Every mountain will be brought low. Every valley lifted up. Hallelujah. In order to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Hallelujah. And so John was preparing the people for the day of Messiah. And he said, you've got to get ready. Every mountain brought low. Every high place brought low. Every high and lofty thing brought low. Ezekiel chapter 13. Let's read from verse 3 to 5. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of Yahweh. So here in in verse 3 to 5, we see that prophets have a role to prepare the people for the battle of the day of Yahweh. So there's ministry that needs to be happening to prepare. But in Ezekiel's day, God had a bad word for those foolish prophets because they were not prophesying the truth. They were prophesying nothing. They were prophesying their own imaginations. And so it didn't prepare the people for the battle of the day of Yahweh. So there's a battle on the day of Yahweh. How about that? And we need to be prepared. The prophetic ministry, and, and being at the Old Testament, the prophetic ministry was the main ministry that came to the people. And so in the New Testament, there's apostolic ministry, which was the main ministry, but then all the ministries together are meant to be preparing God's people for the day of Yahweh. And there's even a battle on that day. We need to be prepared for battle on that day. So let's, and, 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 and what it is doing is it's actually building a wall. So the preparation for the day is that there's a wall that's been built. The city walls were to protect the people of God. Amen? But when those city walls had gaps in them, the enemy could easily come in. And so have a look in Revelation chapter 16 just to see this great battle on the day of Yahweh that we are to be prepared for. Revelation 16 And we'll read from verse 14 to 16. So verse 14 says, talking about the false prophet, the beast and the dragon, it says, they are spirits of demons. 
Well, it's like, these are the unclean spirits like frogs that came out of the false prophet, the beast and the dragon. It says, They are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So here it's called the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Oh, there's going to be a, there's a big final confrontation between the light and the darkness, between the day and the night. Amen. And Jesus tells us in verse 15 how to prepare. How are we going to prepare for this? Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches. So number one thing we need to do is we need to be watching. How do we watch? We stay in prayer. You know, even the night that Jesus ended up going to the, before he went to the cross, he told them, watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. How are we going to stay strong and ready for the day of the battle of Yahweh, the great day of God Almighty? We need to be watchful in prayer, sober and vigilant in prayer, keeping close to Jesus. So number one is, blessed is he who watches. Then he says, and keeps his garments. So Jesus, need, he wants us to keep our garments. You know, we were praying this morning in, our, in the prayer meeting just up the back here around the Lord's table, putting on the whole armour of God. And we were, we were seeing that putting on the whole armour of God has got to do with putting the word into us in all those areas. And so that really is the clothing of Christ, the word of God over us. He is our clothing. So we need to keep in the word. Amen? We need to keep the word in our inner man. We need to believe the word in our heart. We need to have the word in our mind. We need to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and be clothed for that great day. Otherwise, Jesus says, we'll be walking naked and our shame will be exposed. Now we don't want that to be, when the, when the day of Yahweh comes, you don't want to be found naked. The Apostle Paul says, oh, that I may be found in him. Where do you want to be found on that day? Some people are going to be found trying to hide in rocks and caves. Where are you going to be? In him. Where was Noah on that day? He was in the ark. Amen. Where are you going to be on that day? In Jesus. Amen. Clothed in him not walking naked. And it says, and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So that's the great day of the battle of God Almighty. Amen. Let's go to Obadiah in the Old Testament. Obadiah. Obadiah. Right after Amos, you can go to page 1190 if you've got the Spirit-filled Life Bible. It's between Amos and Jonah. Just before Jonah, just after Amos. A little book, just a one chapter book. So I just want you to read Obadiah verse 15. Obadiah 15 talks about the day of Yahweh. It says, For the day of Yahweh upon all the nations is near. So the day of Yahweh comes upon all nations. No nation will be left out. No nation will be missed. The day of Yahweh upon all nations is near. And then he actually says to them, this is what to watch out for on the day. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. So again, we're seeing it's a day of judgment. It's a day of recompense for the way that nations have acted. But let's read on in verse 17. It's not only a day of judgment, but it says, But on Mount Zion, on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Oh, hallelujah. So the day of Yahweh is a day of judgment on the nations, but for those who are on Mount Zion, there is deliverance. Hallelujah. Does that mean we all need to catch a plane and get over to Jerusalem and hang out on Mount Zion? No. Because in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22, it says that we have come, you have come, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So we are to be found on Mount Zion. This is a spiritual location. This is a, a heavenly reality that we walk in. We have come to this Mount Zion by revelation, by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mount Zion is the place of all authority. It's the place where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. That's Mount Zion. 
That's where, that's where Janet wants to be. And she's there, hallelujah. And it says, so, so for those on Mount Zion, there's deliverance. So the day of Yahweh for us who are on Mount Zion is a wonderful day to look forward to because it's, it's the day of complete deliverance. Hallelujah. It's also a day of holiness. So those on Mount Zion will be found holy. Totally separated under God. And it says, The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. So the day of Yahweh is a, t- is a place, it's a time of inheritance. The fullness of the inheritance being delivered. Where the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Hallelujah. And remember that the path of the just shines ever brighter, even under the perfect day. So more and more we're walking into this reality until the day fully manifests. Hallelujah. Verse 18, it goes on, that in that day the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. This is talking of the people of God. They shall be as a fire in that day. So who's God going to be using even to judge the nations? Well, it says here that, that the house of Esau then will be stubble. Esau, remember Jacob and Esau? Remember how Esau, he, 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 he sold his birthright and he, he forfeited his inheritance. And Jacob received it. And so Esau, it says, you know, just for a morsel of food, he sold his birthright. He was a fornicator and a profane person, the book of Hebrews says. He was a man of the flesh. And so Esau, even here prophetically, is re- can be representing the flesh. The house of the flesh will be like stubble. The house of Jacob will be as a fire. Hallelujah. So God will be using his people to burn up every bit of wickedness. All the flesh will be as stubble. Hallelujah. In the day of Yahweh. And it even says, And no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau. No more flesh. Hallelujah. (laughs) Who wants to be walking in the day where there's no more flesh? Where it's just the spirit of life in Christ Jesus filling everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this is the day that we're looking forward to, that the house of Esau will be like stubble. The house of Jacob and the house of Joseph will be a fire and a flame in that day. Wow. And then in verse 21, it just says, Then saviors or deliverers shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom shall be Yahweh's. So another aspect of this day of judgment is that deliverers will come to Mount Zion. Again, are you one of those deliverers? Have you come to Mount Zion? You have a job to do as a deliverer on Mount Zion. It's to judge the mountains of Esau, to judge the high places of the flesh, of the men, of the, of men who are in the flesh. And the kingdom, the finality of the day of Yahweh is that the kingdom shall be Yahweh's. The kingdom of God fully manifested in the earth. Hallelujah. Awesome. Let's look at one final Old Testament prophetic verse. There's many others and you can do a good study on it. Let's go to Malachi chapter 4. It's the final final, um, chapter before the New Testament scriptures. So Malachi 4 verse 1 to 6. Verse 1 starting here. For behold the day is coming. Say the day is coming. And that day is burning like an oven. So you notice that the day's got a lot to do with fire. It's going to be hot. (laughs) And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. Here's that stubble again. Remember the house of Esau would be like stubble on that day. Here it says that the the wicked, those who are proud and those who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. Yes, and so in a little bit after this, we're just going to look at the New New Testament and see how this day burns the proud and wicked up. And it's it's going to leave neither root nor branch for the wicked. So it's going to every bit of wickedness and pride will be rooted out fully. There'll be no root, no branch left. Nothing can grow up again. The day of Yahweh has that finality about it. The day is coming, and there'll be no root, no branch left of wickedness. 
And then it says though in verse 2, another wonderful promise here. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. So the day of Yahweh is a double-edged sword. Amen? The day of Yahweh is a destruction of the wicked, but to those who fear the name, the Son of Righteousness rises and there's healing in his wings. See, the day has the sun rising. Hallelujah. The day dawning and the healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Who wants to be fat? <laughs> this fat's good. <laughs> this is you now carrying the fullness of God, the fullness of the inheritance. Amen. Hallelujah. Because the Son of Righteousness has risen. And as we're going to see in another verse soon in Peter, he, the, the, the day dawns in your heart and he arises in you. And then it says in verse 3 that to you who are fearing the name, you shall trample the wicked. You're going to trample the wicked. And they, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. They're going to be burnt and you're going to walk over the top. Hallelujah. On that day, on the day that I do this, says Yahweh of hosts. Hallelujah. Are you getting these verses into you? Because this is your destiny. Amen. This is your destiny as those who fear the name of Yahweh. Do you fear the name of Yahweh? Well, this is your destiny, brethren, in the day that is coming, which is burning like an oven. Now, verse 4 to 6 then tells us how to be prepared. How do we prepare for this day as those who fear the name? Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Remember the teaching. Remember the instruction. Remember all that Jesus commanded you. Matthew 28, 20. Putting it in the context for us. Amen. Jesus the Christ is the fulfilment of all the law of Moses. So remember Jesus the Christ. Remember to be doing what he told you to do, commanded you to observe. Amen? Remember the statutes and the judgments and the commandments that he's given. And then in verse 5, he says, God said he's going to do something. He says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. So this is a great and a dreadful day. Amen? It's a day that inspires awe. It's a day that is awesome in the right sense of the word. But God's going to do something before that day. He's going to send the prophet Elijah. Hallelujah. Now I'm not going to go into it, but if you just give you the verses, but if you see in Matthew 17, verse 11 and 12, it's interesting in the context because in Matthew 17, Jesus was transfigured and, and Paul brought that out, that Peter said that when he was a part of that awesome event when Jesus was transfigured, that Peter said that, that was, he was actually an eyewitness of the coming, the power and the coming of the Lord. And when they come down out of that experience of experiencing the power and coming, they begin to say, why does it say that Elijah must come first? They knew that they had experienced the great and dreadful day, if you like. Wow! So how come Elijah needs to come first? And Jesus said, well, Elijah has come first and he is coming first. In other words, he has come in John the Baptist to prepare for this day that you're in right now, but he is coming to prepare for that great and dreadful day. Amen? So that first advent of Jesus was not... It was the beginning, if you like, of that day, but that day, that great and dreadful day, is yet to come. But we're shining ever brighter under that perfect day. We're growing up for that day to come. Hallelujah. And God's sending the prophet Elijah. So what does that mean? It really means that he's sending the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare us. Because what's the, what's the prophet Elijah, what's the spirit and power of Elijah going to do in verse 6 to prepare us for the coming of this great and dreadful day? It says he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So in other words, he's going to send the prophet Elijah to release sonship, to release the spirit of adoption. Hallelujah. 
so that the hearts of the fathers will turn to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. So to prepare us for this coming of this great and dreadful day, God is releasing the spirit of sonship into his church to grow up, to become sons who can then father others so that this father and son relationship, this family relationship in the church is restored so that we come to know him as Abba Father. Hallelujah. So that we become sons because he says if that doesn't happen, God will strike the earth with a curse. But if it does happen, what's the, what's the flip side? Yes, he'll release blessing into the earth. The sons of God will manifest and deliver creation from its bondage before the coming of the great and awesome day. Hallelujah. So are you being prepared for the awesome day of Yahweh? Hallelujah. So let's go into the New Testament. And I just want to open up firstly in 2 Peter chapter 3, just some verses that Paul didn't touch on in his sharing on preparing for his coming. So Peter talks about a fire as well. And I want to bring out to you what, what is going to burn up. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, so now we've got New Testament. Now we're in the New Testament day of the Lord. Amen. And in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, and we're going to just do 10 to 13, it says, But the day of the Lord, say the day of the Lord, will come as a thief in the night. Amen. So it's going to be sudden, unexpected for some. And it says, In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So many people have thought then that this verse must be talking about some big nuclear warfare that's going to happen and the whole earth is going to burn literally on fire and be destroyed. But let's, let's think about what is really happening here. Well, in, even in the Old Testament scriptures we saw, the day of the Lord, what was it going to burn up? The wicked, the proud. Yeah. It says the house of Esau would be like stubble that will be burned. Amen. It says that the proud and wicked will be like stubble and they will be burned up. So God's, God's not, God is interested in burning up what is wicked. Amen. And it says that the elements will melt with fervent heat. And so I want to bring out to you this word elements, Miriam. So the word elements here. It's a Greek word, number 4747. So elements, Greek number 4747. And it's the Greek word stoikion, S-T-O-I, S-4747. And it's the Greek word S-T-O-I-C-H-E-I-O-N, stoikion. And this is what it means. It means something orderly, in arrangement, fundamental, initial. An arrangement, fundamental, initial, and basal, a base, foundational. It's something that another thing is built upon. Amen? So they, they are the first principles. They are, they are the things that other things are built upon. They are building blocks. And this word is used in a number of interesting situations and I just want to show you a couple. Look in Galatians chapter 4. I'll just tell you that, that nowhere in the New Testament is this word actually used to describe physical building blocks as in the elements like chemical elements or mineral elements. It's not actually used for earthly, physical elements. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Hmm. The elements of the world. Another version actually says, The rudimentary spirits of this world. But we were in bondage under the elements the fundamental things of this world. And let me read verse 9 to you of Galatians chapter 4. So verse 9 says, But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? So these elements actually cause people to be in bondage rather than freedom in Christ. 
These are beggarly elements of the world. Just put these verses so that people can look them up. Colossians 2 verse 8 and verse 20 are also where this word is mentioned. And it talks about the basic principles of the world which we've died to in Christ so that we can live according to his principles. Amen? Because in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 and also chapter 6 and verse 1 Oh, it's just chapter 5, verse 12. Just chapter 5, verse 12. It talks about the first principles of the oracles of God. These are the good elements. So that word for principles is the same word, stoichion, the first principles of the oracles of God. And these are actually those elementary principles of Christ. Principles equals elements. Eli. So we are to be delivered from the elements of the world and come into the elements of Christ. Hallelujah. So that we can stand in the day when the elements are melted with a fervent heat. Hallelujah. See, the elements of this world, the beggarly elements, they're going to melt with fervent heat. They're going to be burnt up. All those wicked false doctrines and false teachings of men and doctrines of demons and deceiving spirits and principalities and powers, they will burn up. Hallelujah. They will melt with fervent heat. The building blocks that the world system is built on will melt. Hallelujah. In the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. And we're growing ever brighter to that perfect day. Hallelujah. You know, remember when the demons met with Jesus and they said, are you here to torment us before the time? Are you going to burn us up before the time? Even the demons know what's going to happen to them. (laughs) Hallelujah. You see, they knew there was a day coming. And they thought, are you going to do it now? I thought it was going to be a bit later. (laughs) They'll probably keep trying to say that, keep holding it off. So let's go to 2 Peter 3 verse 11. Because now it tells us, what sort of people are we meant to be in view of the day of the Lord coming in this way? It says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved... Hallelujah, the day of the Lord is going to dissolve all of the wicked elements that are in the world. And so what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What sort of persons ought we to be? You see, understanding the day of the Lord is meant to change our life. It's meant to cause us to desire to have a holy conduct and godliness. Amen? We're to walk in a holy conduct and a godliness. So just under this holy conduct and godliness, holy conduct has got to do with our behaviour. How are we behaving ourselves? Are we conducting ourselves in a manner that is separated under the Lord? Are we conducting ourselves well in the house of God, which is the church of the living God? You can just put 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 under there. It's got to do with our conduct. So to prepare for the coming of the Lord, we need to learn how to conduct ourselves in the house of God. Amen? And in the context of 1 Timothy chapter 3.15, Paul said, I'm writing to you that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And then in verse 16 of 1 Timothy 3.16, he starts to open up what the mystery of godliness is all about. See, Peter said we need to have holy conduct and godliness. And so he said that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit. So our behaviour, our conduct, is to be in a manner of godliness. In other words, allowing God, that, that we are walking in such a way that Jesus walked. Jesus was God in the flesh. He showed us the conduct of a godly life. And so what sort of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness in view if all these things are going to take place, if the elements will melt with fervent heat, how will we be found? In verse 12 of 2 Peter chapter 3, it just says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So brethren, as we are walking in holy conduct and godliness, 
we are looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. So we have an active role in seeing the day of God come to pass. Hallelujah. And how does it happen? By us, our holy conduct, walking in a godly way, just as Jesus walked. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to another one. Let's go in just back a few chapters. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. This is when Peter is describing his experience with Jesus on the mount where he was transfigured. And so Peter sums it up by saying, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Or we also have the more sure prophetic word. We've got the prophetic word of the scriptures confirmed now because we experienced it on the mountain. We experienced the coming. We experienced the day of the Lord. And you will do well to heed this prophetic word which is confirmed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Hallelujah. So how do we prepare for this day? By heeding the prophetic word which has been confirmed. Hallelujah. By believing Peter. Do you believe Peter? Do you believe he experienced the power and coming? Do you believe he experienced that day? Well, Peter said, that's the prophetic word confirmed. And you will do well if you heed this prophetic word, if you listen to it, obey it, hear under it. If you heed that prophetic word, then you will experience the day dawning in you. Hallelujah. So the day of the Lord is to dawn in your heart. Hallelujah. So this is why I said before that we are to be found walking in that day even before that day fully manifests. Hallelujah. Let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 5 and 6 to begin with. Paul is thanking the Philippians, he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Yes. So the first thing in verse 5 was that Paul loved the fellowship of the gospel with the brethren. So how are we going to prepare for this day? By being in the fellowship of the gospel with the brethren. Staying in the fellowship of the gospel. Hallelujah. Do you love being in the fellowship of the gospel? So this, is, this is really talking, it's got the sense that it's saying in the fellowship of the you know, moving of the gospel, the, the outworking of the command of Jesus to go and make disciples of all the nations and to preach the gospel to every creature. So we're in the fellowship of the gospel moving through the nations. And then he says that he's confident of this very thing, that he who began the good work in you will complete it until the day. So we are to have a confidence that God who began this good work in us, he's going to complete it until the day. Hallelujah. Until the day of Jesus the Christ. Do you have that confidence in you? So I believe that you'll have that confidence in you the more we find ourselves in fellowship in the gospel. Knowing that God will complete the work. Hallelujah. And so Paul says that it's, it's right for him to think of the, the Philippians in this way. Because in verse 7, the main point I want you to see out of there is he says to them, you are all partakers of grace with me. Hallelujah. So how do, we, how do we prepare for this day or how do we get the confidence to know that God will complete his work in us until that day? By being a partaker of the grace with Paul. Hallelujah. Partaking of the grace we need the grace. And then from verse 9 to 11, Paul prays a prayer that is a prayer to prepare us for this day. It's an awesome prayer. We don't, seem to, we, we don't focus on this prayer very much, but it's an awesome prayer. He says, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. So Paul prays for our love to abound 
but not in a silly way. He says it should abound in knowledge and all discernment. Amen? Be discerning in the way you love and allow that love to abound. Because verse 10 says that if you, if you love with knowledge and discernment, you will be able to approve the things that are excellent. So God wants the people who are in the earth approving the things which are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Messiah. Hallelujah. So that we're found sincere and without offence. It's very easy to get offended, isn't it? But one of the ways for us to, to, to stay out of getting offence is, uh, is to pray that our love will abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment and that we focus on approving the things which are excellent so that we can remain sincere in our hearts, not messed up, and without offence till the day of Christ. And verse 11 says, being filled with all the fruits of righteousness. Hallelujah. So Paul was preparing the Philippians for the day, encouraging them that the day of the Lord was coming and this is how we are to prepare. We're to be a people abounding in love with knowledge and all discernment. We're to be a people approving those things which are excellent. Approving holy marriage between a man and a woman. Amen. Amen. Approving the things that are excellent. Hallelujah. And now also Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 to 16. The day of the Lord. Paul again, in the context of the day. The, the day of Christ comes up in verse 16, but from verse 12 to 15, he's, prepare, he's, he's again showing us how to get ready for the day of the Lord. Even going through a bit of this study myself, I was just amazed to see that in the letters, the coming and the day are always in focus in the gospel. Amen? That we're to be living our lives in view of that. We're being prepared for that. Hallelujah. Just like Paul said in, in his sharing on preparing for the coming, we're not being prepared for heaven. We're being prepared for the coming. We're being prepared for the day of the Lord. And so God is wanting us to get ready. And so how do we get ready? Verse 12, My beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's a working out of our salvation. So it's not just saved to go to heaven when you die. There's a working out of this salvation. Once you've received Jesus, been baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit, now there's a working out of this salvation with fear and trembling even. Why in fear and trembling? Because we're getting ready for the day. Are you going to be able to stand in that day? How do we work out this salvation? In verse 13, by allowing God to work in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So in this working out of your salvation, it's not you working, it's actually you cooperating with God working in you. It's you allowing God to work in you so that you'll both, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So God is working in you to change your will so that you're willing and doing his good pleasure. And then verse 14 is a, is a good one. Do all things without complaining and disputing. This has got to do with preparing for the day of the Lord. Are you, are you complaining and disputing? Are you arguing and grumbling about this and that? Are you arguing and grumbling about different leaders that have been over you? Are you arguing and complaining about your husband or your wife? Or what, there's many things we could decide to argue and complain about and dispute about. But, Jesus, but Paul is telling us that we're to do all things without complaining or disputing. Why? Verse 15. So that we may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Hallelujah. So we are to be that light. 1 Thessalonians 5, which you might just look at quickly before we close, talks about us being sons of light, sons of the day. 
Because in verse 16 of Philippians 2, then it says, Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. How are you going to be found in the day of Christ? Are you going to be found as a child of God in the midst of a shining as a light in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation? Not complaining, not disputing, not arguing. Allowing God to work in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Hallelujah. Is this helping you to know what to be ready for? Just put these down. We won't go through them, but just put the passage Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. It's another awesome passage about how to prepare. The basic summary is that we have boldness now to come to the throne of his glory. We have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And, and we can come with full assurance of faith in a true heart, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And then we are to love one another and stir up another, one another for love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So how do we prepare for the day? It's by entering into the Holy of Holies. It's by knowing that we have boldness to enter that place in fellowship with the rest of the brethren, that we're not forsaking assembling ourselves together, but we're stirring each other up for love and good works. So that, and even more so as the day approaches. So that when he comes, we're found up loving and doing good works in his name. Hallelujah. So that's Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, preparing for the day. Hallelujah. And so let's go 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and see Paul here teaching on that day. Starting in verse 2. He says to the Thessalonians, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Verse 2. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them as labour pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. And see, many a people, even in these days, will be saying peace and safety. It's not the Muslims. It's not Islam that's the problem. It's these radical people, you know. It's these radical terrorists. It's not Islam, you know. Peace and safety, everybody. People will be saying, oh, it's all good. Everything's okay. The economy's fine, even though it's, you know, $100 to pay for a loaf of bread now. It's all good. We'll get back together. Peace and safety, but sudden destruction comes upon them. Verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you, so that this day should overtake you. You see, for those of us who are believing in Jesus, this day does not come as a thief in the night because we're ready for it. Hallelujah. This day will not overtake us as a thief. It's not going to be a sudden destruction on us. Amen? Why? Because in verse 5 it says, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. Remember in the beginning, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. We are, we are sons of light. We are sons of the day. That means we are manifesting the light and the day. The Son of God manifested God. That term to be a son of, is we're manifesting it. Sons of light, sons of the day. So that you can, be a walk, you can be a person who's walking around who's a living testimony of the day of the Lord that is coming. You know, there was a group back in the 1700s that became the Quakers, or the 1600s. They became the Quakers. There was a guy named James Fox who began that movement. And their main message everywhere they went was the day of the Lord. And he even wrote in his journals that they'd, got, they'd stopped sort of, they'd moved off and started preaching some other things and there was no more power in what they were doing. And he said, we need to get back to preaching the day of the Lord. And they just went everywhere preaching the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And people were convicted, people were coming to know Jesus through them. Hallelujah. The day of the Lord. And so verse 6 tells us what we're to do. Let us not sleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. Watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Verse 8, just a key one here. But let us who are of the day be sober, 
putting on a breastplate, on the breastplate of faith and love, as a, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. How do we prepare for the day? By putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Amen. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that day is not to be a day of wrath for us who are sons of the day. It's actually the day of salvation. Hallelujah. It's the day of full deliverance. Ephesians 4.30, Paul calls it the day of redemption by which you were sealed by the Holy Spirit for that day. Hallelujah. Say, I am sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Hallelujah. Awesome. And just to leave you on this, I'll read it to you. Romans 13. You can just put the passage there, 11 to 14. I'll read this to you. This is the exhortation of the Apostle Paul. And do this, knowing the time, Romans 13, 11 to 14, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly, decently, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil its lusts. Brethren, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. That means make no premeditated thought to fulfil the lusts of your flesh. Hallelujah. So are you prepared for the day of the Lord? Are you getting there? Amen. So brethren, let these words just wash over you and allow them now to fill you so that you'll be ready for the day that is coming upon all flesh. Amen. God bless you.